In this, my second video on impossible things, I want to briefly show you that nothing you see is what it seems to be. This is just a quick intro into a huge subject which I have only just started looking into in any depth, but I find it fascinating and hope to tickle your brains with it as well. This image is from the Wikipedia page on colour. When viewed in its original 1000 by 1000 format, the image contains 1 million pixels, each of a different colour. How many can you name? Now a human eye can supposedly differentiate about 10 million different colours, but that is not the whole story. There was a 2011 BBC Horizon programme titled Do You See What I See? which goes into some fascinating details on this subject, and I would of course encourage you to watch it if you can find it on the webs. I will also pop some other references into the info box for your delectation. Here I want to suggest that the colours you see in the world around you might well be merely pigments of your imagination. The first thing to understand is that colour is not a property of the electromagnetic spectrum. It is purely a property of observation. And whilst I might assume that the colours I see are roughly the same as the colours you see, Research would suggest otherwise. We see colours differently based on our culture, our language, our age, and even our mood. Colours are to a large degree dictated by our language. Or perhaps more accurately, the language centres of our brains affect how we perceive colours. And we do not perceive colours in isolation. Rather, our brain considers all the light it receives from the visual field before determining what each colour is. An example of this is the transition of walking outside, that is, moving from artificial light into natural light. The natural light spectrum differs from that of artificial light. It is typically shifted more towards the blue end of the spectrum. It should, by rights, give everything a blue tinge, which of course it does. It is our brains which modify what we perceive, so that if we carry a bowl of fruit outside, we do not perceive the colours of the fruit to change, though the light received on our retinas does actually change. This is another case of our brains fooling us, and is called colour constancy. Optical illusions play on these effects. Here is a quick example of that. In Photoshop I use the eyedropper tool to select the yellow colour of this square. I now change to the paint bucket tool and fill the square with the selected colour. And of course the colour doesn't change. I now fill this top square with that same colour, and we can see how our brain has fooled us. This is the effect of colour constancy. Our brain considering the visual field before determining what each colour we see actually is. Here's a clearer demonstration of how our brain decides what colours to present to us. Please concentrate on the dot in the centre of the screen and try not to let your gaze wander. I want you to keep looking at that dot as I explain why. Now, what is happening here is that your brain is learning that the left side of your visual field is bathed in a green light environment, while the right side of your visual field is in a red light environment. And your brain will compensate your colour perception accordingly in an attempt to achieve colour constancy. Now, keep concentrating on that same spot on the screen as I change the picture. What you should experience is that your left visual field appears to have gained a red filter, whilst your right visual field appears to have gained a green filter. That is, your brain adjusting the input from your eyes. You are not seeing what you perceive you are seeing. Odd that, isn't it? But how is language involved in colour perception? Consider this chart. This is a result of an online survey carried out asking people simply to name colours presented to them. The consensus colour names were plotted here from 1.5 million survey results. And I think most of us would generally accept the delineations as laid out. But a couple of things should stand out to you. They do to me. One is the disparity in size of the colour areas, such that gold gets a very specific part of the spectrum. But bog-standard blue and especially green get a huge swathe of the spectrum. Now, I can think of reasons for that. But the second thing to consider is that all the lines drawn on this chart are completely arbitrary. Why isn't green split into 15 more named categories? Why is the line between maroon and purple where it is? 
This is down to language and association, our ability, need and desire to name things, which is driven by various imperatives including evolutionary and cultural. And our ability to name colours dictates to an extent how well we can differentiate them. Our colour vocabulary has increased throughout history. I could probably only name a few different blues, and I am certain that that limits my appreciation of art, and makes me crap at buying clothes. Wikipedia states, with references to back it up, that many languages do not have different words for green and blue. Look at the chart and consider the implication of that. Nearly half the colour spectrum you see there covered by one name in these languages. Japanese, for instance, only gained a distinct word for green around a hundred years ago. Before that, green and blue were covered by the same Japanese word. And this leads to the anomaly that a Japanese child might be encouraged to eat up all their blues, and a Japanese green traffic light is also called blue. Both of these are language hangovers from a previous age. And in English, pink only entered our language as the colour we now know a couple of hundred years ago. Prior to that, pink was used to describe certain shades of yellow. Pink as we now know it is actually named after the flowers called pinks. The etymology of their name is possibly from the German picken to peck due to their frilly edges. And we retain that meaning of the word today in pinking shears. Nearly at the end of the video now and I hope I've given you some food for thought and perhaps encouraged you to look deeper into colour perception and the history of colours, and why you see what you think you see. I started by suggesting that our colour perception is inextricably linked to language. If I've not yet convinced you of that, I offer you this. What do you see here? If you're an average Joe or Josephine, you'll see two circles made up of 12 squares. Can you spot the odd one out? That, of course, is a trick question. We can probably all see the blue square standing out on the right-hand side. But can you spot the odd one out on the left-hand side? The Himba people of northern Namibia certainly could. They were discussed in some detail in the aforementioned Horizon program. The Himba would typically see this image differently than you or I. They would very quickly point out the odd one out on the left-hand side of the screen, but would have great difficulty differentiating any of the squares on the right-hand side of the screen, if they could manage it at all. This is because they perceive colours differently through their language. So they can differentiate subtly differing shades of green that we might not even be able to perceive. But their ability to differentiate generally between blue and green is extremely poor. This is not a biological issue, but a language one. It is simply that they have different words for different greens, but do not have a word that differentiates green from blue. I hope you have enjoyed the video. If you have, Please let me know by clicking on the bright orange thumbs up icon down below and thanks for watching.